Hi everyone, welcome to another Rahala Stubba this week with 90s legend, Games Masters, Dominic Diamond. Um, this is a lot of fun, this one. Loads of interesting stuff. I know you're going to enjoy it. We've uh, switched the running order a little bit, so it's slightly out of sequence. Um, so that you can uh, buy and join in with the Kickstarter campaign for the Games Master book. If this podcast whets your appetite, which maybe it will. It's um, really interesting stuff. I really enjoyed seeing Dominic again for the first time since I was on Games Master. Um, hey, look, thanks so much, everyone, for all the lovely messages and support over my recent illness. Um, I'm feeling a lot better right now. Um, and hopefully we are now cancer free and can carry on with these crazy podcasts. For the rest of all eternity, I will never die. I am now immortal. Do check out Twitch of Fun on Thursday nights, uh, where my right bollock does get a little mention. New puppets added all the time. Uh, and um, do keep coming back on Wednesdays to Twitch of Fun. We've got some gigs coming up at the Clapham Grand, which will be both live streamed and have a socially distant audience of about 350 people. So I'm just in the process of trying to book some big names for those. It would be lovely if you could support us by buying a ticket, either online or in actual person. I'm so excited about doing these for um, getting back into a theatre in front of an audience again. It's been a tough year doing these in the void, but I hope you've enjoyed them nonetheless. Um Anyway, that's enough of that. Let's sit back, relax. RichardHerring.com slash gigs. And you'll find out all about who's coming up as soon as I announce them. Let's sit back, relax and enjoy Raha Lustapa with Dominic Diamond. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, nothing's working, Chris. Please welcome a man who's had chemo five days ago. Oh, look, it's all loading up. It's Richard Herring. Oh, that won't go away. Ah, oh, it's got away. Hooray. Hello. Welcome. We've had some technical difficulties, as always, and uh, hopefully you can see us. Uh, I'm a hero. I'm, yeah, I've had chemotherapy five days ago, and I'm still here. And, I, you know, I'm not at 100%, but uh, I don't like to use the word hero, but it is what I am. So welcome to uh, Richard Herring's uh, Stargazers Telescope, sorry, Lone Stargazers Telescope podcast. Woo! Um, but uh, I was talking to uh, Sir Patrick Moore the other day. He's, he's doing all right. He was on his xylophone. Uh, he calls it Rahalastapa, so I don't know if that's gonna catch on hopefully that will catch on uh yes it's uh it's been a bit of a weird week for me look at that it's we've got him he's the games master he's back he's back from the dead if you're watching the video if you listen to the audio there's just a picture of patrick moore with a big crown on behind me that's all you need to know um and uh yeah i did i had uh, uh chemotherapy on uh friday it's an interesting experience it's a very light i just went for the light one um, and it's just a one-off, and it's nowhere near as bad as m most people will have experienced if they've had chemotherapy. Um, when I went in, the the nurse measured me, and she said I was 177 centimeters, which seemed too high to me. But I was a bit befuddled and confused, and I said, "Are you sure I'm 177 centimeters?" Uh, and she said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm sure." And I said, "Oh, because I thought I, w I thought she said just maybe it's because you're wearing trainers, you're taller than you think you are." I thought I, thought I was about 100. I thought I was under 170. Uh, and I went and Googled it and I was so flattered that she thought I was five foot ten that I nearly didn't tell her. But then I thought maybe that will affect how much chemotherapy they give me. Would it be worth dying just to be of average height just for in, in one person's mind? I, I wasn't sure. So that was my main that uh, we did sort it out. I'm 168 centimetres high and proud of it. Um, there hasn't been too many... Um, Side effects, luckily, I've lost my appetite a little bit, which is not a problem uh, since I've lost a testicle. I put on a bit of weight as I ate biscuits. 
but you know, obviously the weight of the testicle was probably half a stone. Uh, but I've lost um, I've lost uh, about three kilos in the last three weeks. Uh, and losing my appetite is not a bad thing. Thank you, cancer. That's all I can say. I love cancer. I've, I've tried the cancer diet, and it's working out for me. <laughs> Great. Don't don't try and get it. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm not sure. I was. I thought I would get superpowers. Uh, all that's happened is I'm quite tired um, some of the time. Monday was very tired. Today I'm a little bit tired. Um, and um, apparently my wee is radioactive or something. I don't know. I have if I wee on the floor or the seat, I have to wipe it up. Uh, if I were to ejaculate, if that were to happen, I have to wear a condom. They didn't talk about uh, whether what I can do with wanking, so I don't know what I don't know what the what the sperm will do if it lands on me, or the wee or the sperm lands on me. Will it burn through me? Will it hurt me, or can it harm other people? I don't know. They didn't tell me. Uh, all I know is I have magical powers, uh, and uh, I guess the only other thing that's happened is that. Uh, my wife has got. The, I have to have a little injection to get my white blood cells going, which my wife uh, has been doing the last couple of mornings, and it's. I think she's enjoying being able to stick a big needle into my stomach, um, and it's a bit like I'm a, a giant sized voodoo doll of myself, uh, somewhere a very tiny version of me, is uh, probably in great pain. But it's been okay. Um, thanks for supporting us through Twitch. You know, I've carried on doing this every week. Jeremy Paxman a week after losing my testicles today, five days after chemo. You don't have to reward me with money, but if you want to subscribe with Amazon Prime to Twitch, that would be lovely. Do remember to resubscribe uh, if you can. Uh, and let's get on with it. Let's let's see how it goes. Uh, if I fall asleep during the show, it is no uh, indication of uh, of what our guest's interestingness. Um, he is probably best known as part of David Icke and the Orphans of Jesus. That's why we're all here to see him today. Will you please welcome the amazing Dominic Diamond, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully there he is. Thank you Dominic very Diamond. much. Thank you. That's my pleasure. Lovely to see you all the way from Canada, I understand. Yes, it's a sunny day in Canada. I hope it looks okay. I, I, I was slightly, um, I know I've got a lot to live up to visually after Jeremy Paxman <laughs> and his um, wonderful attempt at homage of that girl in the Blair Witch Project scene. <laughs> um, so, so I hope well, this if you can a have bit... a gigantic bulb behind your head just to make yourself look like you're possibly yes. tiny. That's that's what most people do. Yes. Um, let first of all, I just want to say I'm, I was very sorry to hear about Dustin. You must have been very, you must have been very upset. Yes. About it. So I, I, hope, I thank you for still doing this doing this show after. I, am, I imagine he's your brother, Dustin Diamond. Yeah, and that leaves me as the uh, second biggest diamond standing after Anne. Neil gets really <laughs> fucked off because he's number three, four. He's way down. No one. It's been a long yeah. time since he had a hit. But just Anne, as soon as she dies, she's not dead, is yeah. she? That would be terrible. She's not. She's still going. I have met. I've met. I've been on a couple of shows with Anne Diamond. I remember when Anne Diamond first came on Nationwide and she did... Did she, she really? Was, doing something. was it radioactive? She, yes. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh, doing the Brit Awards. Her first report I saw on wearing a kind of funky headband. And I thought... And I was a young man. I was a boy, probably. But I thought she was a very, very sexy woman. My first impression of Anne Diamond. And she still is, I think. Yeah, but, um, so. um, Does she smell so it was sad about in particular? I, like fragrance? Does she smell? I didn't, I, don't, I didn't pick up a fragrance from her. I was on. I think I was on the right stuff with her. That's you know. That's how. Oh yeah, I used to be on that. The, the big, t the big time. You know. That's, yes. that's, what, that's the people who were in the nineteen nineties. So look, it's lovely to see you. Uh, and um, I think I don't think we've met since I was on Games Master. Is that right? We may have bumped into each other at some it's, party it's, it's along been the way. A while. I, I, I don't think. We... I hoped we would have ended up closer. <laughs> than that but no it really was just a thank you dominic goodbye ignoring my calls <laughs> for you know a quarter of a century it's a quarter of a century and it's 1995 so more than a quarter of a century it's very impressive wow um i mentioned i see i didn't know this about you so there's lots i've found out uh, researching this week um this david ike and the orphans of jesus is actually yeah. a fairly big deal because this is your university comedy club night yes that you that you organised at Bristol University. So tell us a little about about that first, because that is yeah, it was um, it, it, it turned out to be quite a kind of launching pad for people. There was me. There was a guy called uh, Simon Pegg, um, another guy called uh, David Walliams, 
I, Jason Bradbury, who went on to uh, present the Gadget Show in the UK, Mavan <laughs> Moore, who was the executive producer of Little Britain and, and like queen of BBC comedy or something. And yeah, so they, so I, I was the kind of first one to do stand up. And I thought, I mean, I was a poor student and I wanted a way of fleecing others to make money. So I, all these other guys were interested in doing comedy. So I was like, well, let's, let's put a weekly night on. And, yeah. um, and I have a, I think it's might even appear in the, in the book that we'll, we'll talk about. I've got like a, an account sheet from the time. And basically I think that Simon and David and everyone ended up with 12 pounds 50 a week. Uh, I ended up getting, I got three times, it was run on socialist principles because obviously, you know, we were students. So everybody got yeah. a, a unit of the, of the takings on the door, but I got a unit for being MC, a unit for organizing and a unit for my own bit in it. So I got three times the money of uh, nice. Simon Pegg, which was the last time that happened. <laughs> <laughs> We take that for just a day now. Can we have one day three times? <laughs> exactly. <one? laughs> but it's but it, it's interesting because the, the, there was a there's a VHS video of it somewhere and I can't find it. But uh, oh Simon was absolutely astonishing. He he went on that stage a fully fledged comic behemoth. It was a a, a swimming pool lifeguard character that he had that wrote poems about his obsessive love for Diane Keaton. And it was, just, it was brilliant. It was genius. He, he, he just could move an audience in a way that, that I realized I, I was never going to be able to do. And I, cause I, I mean, I was okay, but I had to work so hard at it and write jokes and hone them and hone them. And it just seemed Simon could just do it like that, you know, which was amazing. Right. David Warren's was shit though. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, him and Jason were pretty crap, but uh, Simon, brilliant. Yeah, it's interesting though. That I've, you know, there's a few little pockets where, like, at a university at a certain time, there's a group of people, and whether it's just there's one person at the centre who's pushing that group to all go and try and be professional, or whether it is just, you know, I, I was in the middle. You know, I, Armando Iannucci, Stuart Lee, Al Murray, Sally Phillips, you know, Re Rebecca Front, and, and yeah. all sort of David Schneider, all sorts of people at the same time as me. Uh, there's one. There's one in Durham University, which we've been discussing quite recently in recent episodes uh, in the sort of 2000s. Uh, and it's sort of interesting that suddenly, like a, a big group of people appear in one place and all go on to to do something. It's it's it doesn't happen that often. I wonder what I I don't know what the magic is that makes that happen. But if you knew, well, I think in our case it, it was me. It was you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, um, so, uh, yeah. And, you know, do I get any thanks for it? Am I, am I, you know, regaled, celebrated for that? No, it's all fucking video games. What, 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 are you, what can you do? What? I think there's an, I think that I feel like with our group, I was the one, so I knew I wanted to be a comedian. So I was pushing and I had a plan, you know, to go to London and do all this stuff. And so I feel like we did carry a few people along with us who might not have, <laughs> Yeah, who might not have been comedians, but uh, that's that's how it's ended up. Um, well, that's that's uh, yeah. So that's an auspicious uh, start, an amazing yeah. uh, beginning to start with all those guys. Um, and uh, and so look, and also I'm interested. You're in Canada now. Let's talk about this first before we talk about anything else. Yeah, you you moved to Canada to become a, a llama farmer. Is this this is what I've heard in other interviews? Is yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I uh, so when it was like two thousand and eight, I noticed that there was a. I really, I thought the UK was becoming a very violent place, and it seemed that that every week there was a story of a dad about the same age as me who would be going out into the street to break up a fight among teenagers, and we'd end up getting stabbed. And I was just like. I felt this was a horrible inevitability about this. So I wanted my kids to kind of grow up in a bit more of a tolerant place. And so we thought about it. But at the time, I, I was the, um, and I used chief in the smallest sense of the word, chief columnist at the Daily Star, which was was a ridiculous amount of money to be paid as a, as a father of three. So I kept saying to my wife, no, we can't do it. We can't do it because her family's Canadian. We can't do it because I'm getting paid all this money. And I was walking into um, a bespoke tailor in Edinburgh one morning and there was a phone call from Don Neeson, the editor of the Daily Star, who said, yeah, I'm really sorry, Dominic, but uh, the owner, Richard Desmond, has decided he wants to purge all columnists. And I'm so glad that she said that before I went and bought the suit. And so <laughs> I, I said to my wife, I said, fuck it, that's it. I said, let's, and we literally went to Nova Scotia. 
on vacation because uh, I had really cheap houses there. And we fell in love with the place, found a, a farm, and we were like, shall we become farmers? And, um, you know, in all our midlife crisis, stupidity and ignorance said, why the hell not? What could possibly go wrong? So we moved over with our three kids and we had this big yellow farmhouse and the, the llamas weren't even there. By the time we got there, we were really stitched up by the despicable owners whose retirement in Mexico, we've single-handedly funded the fucks. And, uh, and you know, hey, there's some people I wish had cancer. Seriously. Anyway, they should. I hope he's getting a ball removed right now, Richard. I wish your ball had been his ball, basically. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, so so basically, we um we had a fantastic time, and I did I didn't do any work. We thought we'll just live off our savings, and we'll. I, I planted like I had a Darmid Gavin and Terence Conran gardening book, so I made a vast flower meadow and all these things like that, and it was great fun. It was the first time I hadn't kind of you know worked for, since I was like twenty one, and it was beautiful. But we 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 ran out of money in a year. And I was a classic, unskilled, unqualified immigrant drain on the resources of Canada. So I literally started from the bottom as a complete unknown, sending off my CV to radio people and then started working for what is the tiniest radio station in Canada, CKBW Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. And I was literally having to read at the weekend lost pet announcements. And my wife used to call me Alan Partridge. She's like, you are Alan Partridge, uh, for real. So I managed to kind of claw my way up the the, the greasy pole and across Canada to a, a certain level of, of success, uh, luckily. Yeah. So, But I'm not a farmer yeah. anymore. Not a farmer not anymore. Not a farmer anymore. But and I like did the llamas? Did they take the llamas to Mexico with them or did they just let them go? Uh, who or knows? Or they all die? Do you know what? Bearing in mind how evil they are, <laughs> they probably use them as some kind of uh, pansexual satanic sacrifice. Nothing nothing was beneath <laughs> those people who sold us that house. Evil people. Yeah. Amazing. Well, look, let's go back to... So you came out of university... Yeah, and having done comedy, you did a lot of comedy. It's very similar to me, I think. You did a lot of drama and comedy at university. Yes, not much work, and no. spent a lot of money on fruit machines. It sounds yes. like it sounds <laughs> like my sounds like my exact. I probably had sex with with one or two people in the in your whole time at university. No, did better, more. Okay, yeah. hunters, well hunters, as they say in Scotland. <laughs> um, but so yeah, so you'd. You were from Arbroath, so you know it's from a working class family in Arbr- in Arbroath. Yes. And did you go back to Arbroath after university? Was that the the plan, or did you? Uh, no, my my uh, my parents had moved down to uh, uh, the wonderful Newport Pagnell, Buckinghamshire, oh, okay. just outside of London, because my uh, my uh, youngest brother and sister went to the illustrious Sylvia Young Theatre Academy in London. Oh, nice. And uh, so my family uh, moved down to Scotland so they could go to school. So we were down there. I never went back to Arbroath, and I did that horrible thing that. I I think a lot of working class people do when they get a bit of money is they completely disassociate themselves <laughs> with their original town and slag it off. And in our broth's case, I would say it smells of fish. And and that was a real shame because it's a lovely, brilliant place. And the people of our broth have been so incredibly loyal to me. They were literally the only people who watched my own Twitch show when it was running. It was literally the town of our broth and that was it. <laughs> and so um, I wish I'd spent more time. I wish I'd given more back to the town of our Growth over the years, Richard. I hope it's something I can possibly correct at There's some still point. Time. You There's know, still build, time. Build, build a youth hostel, so something, some, something. Yeah, you, know, sure you could know. do some good. There. Yeah. So, did was the plan to get into TV? You auditioned for things like the the Word and stuff, but we were you was. Was that the first thing you did to audition for The Word? Or? Yeah, that was because uh, I realised how bad I was at stand-up comedy back then. And I think it's one thing when you do it within the relatively safe confines of, of your own university, like the student balls and everything like that. It's a really friendly crowd. But I, um, uh, like Icarus, I flew too high. Um, but I got noticed by um, uh, uh, Frank Skinner's agent, they did a little comedy workshop in Bristol and I did my bit and, and Frank's agent was like, oh, come and support Frank and Phil Jupitus and, you know, come and, come and work some working men's clubs in Birmingham. So I'm like, oh, yeah, this is it. This is the big time. So I did that like, as, a, as a 19-year-old and was absolutely destroyed by the public. Who uh, And it was my own fault. I, I should have stuck to what I knew, which was, you know, jokes about buying good condoms as a, in a small town of our growth where everybody knows 
shows you. But instead, because I was a student and I thought I had to be anti-Thatcher and left-wing, and 19-year-old left-wing comedians with little round glasses and no facial hair really just get laughed off stage. Brummies just literally go, fuck off, you spicky fucking twat, or however they sound these days. Not like that, sorry. Peaky Blinders, I haven't good, watched enough. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in Canada a long time. I have. I have. So I was, I was very, very <laughs> much looking for a way to not do stand-up comedy, and yeah. uh, and then luckily this, uh, they had the um, open auditions for the ward. I think it was the first ever kind of search for a star reality TV thing that that ever happened. And so I, I got to the last twelve and wasn't physically attractive enough. And so uh, luckily, Games Master were looking for someone who was not physically attractive <laughs> and they were also very lazy so they called up the makers of the ward and said do you have a geek um and they said and one of them said yeah there was this kind of vaguely funny scottish geek and they were like oh great tick that little minority as well let's uh let's give them an audition so i, I was lucky that i you know 21 years old and i, and I got the show so yeah, that so was and there was and the, the, and Games Master was basically the whole of the 1990s. You weren't you there was a series you didn't do or a, yes. a series or two you didn't do. Yes. And um basically you were sort of employed as a and and in a successful it was immediately a, a big success really, wasn't it? And getting good good viewing figures of Channel 4. One of the biggest. And, uh, yeah. One of the biggest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so that but that's it's it was like you know, em, 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 it was like Emmerdale Farm Games Master East End, East End or something like that. No, it was good. <laughs> so we, like very much like we were just we were lucky. We were, we were very lucky, Richard. I mean, you know, to have the video games industry booming at the same time as doing a TV show about yeah. it. We we literally the the games industry and the Games Master TV show just gave each other reach arounds for the rest of the nineties in a mutually <laughs> beneficial way. So it was a, it was a stroke of of extreme luck, really. But then to to be so young and to be discovered almost from nowhere and uh, and and then be sort of propelled into that situation, um, I mean a lot of fun. It sounds like you had a lot of fun, uh, but it's also quite that's quite difficult to cope. You know, I was. It took us a little bit longer to get to to get established, but we we're still sort of twenty five when we we're on TV, and that turns your head and it Oof. you know makes you behave like an asshole. Yeah, and, very uh, much so. And so and so yeah. So and and it sounds like from what I've from what I've read and uh, and heard, you know, you were partying through the through the nineties pretty pretty exclusively when yeah. you weren't when you weren't working. I I was, and and what's been interesting about writing this book? I don't know if we have we actually mentioned the title of it yet. It's okay if we no, haven't. Tell us the I, I like you. It's all right. It's cool because this we'll is a there. long long form conversation. That's all right. That's cool. As long as it doesn't go full Stephen Merchant, I'm okay. <laughs> so uh, no, it's Games Master: The Oral History. See what we did there. Uh, and this really is the first time that the complete story has been told from the points of view of, of uh, not, not just myself, but the producers, the directors, the researchers, the runners, uh, the um, the civilian contestants, if we can use that phrase, and celebrity contestants such as yourself who kindly contributed yeah. uh, their, their memories. And what has been, and it's me kind of running this thread throughout the whole thing, uh, the story of not just the show, but what it was like for someone who was way too young to have that level of fame. Um, and and how I coped, or rather, didn't cope with it. Yeah. And what has been amazing about the book is so many bits I'd read that other people writing about, and I would go like, "We we didn't do that, did we?" And they say, "No, we did." I said, "No, no fucking way." And then they say, "Look, here's the photograph," and they'd be like me and the llama, and, and I'd be like, "Oh my god, <laughs> you're absolutely correct." So uh, so it was very much a voyage of discovery for me. This book as well. I feel like it's a it's a it's a painting by numbers thing that was only half filled in the 90s for me and now it's it's fully fleshed right because i didn't really party very much in the night i was we were working quite hard but i was also i was too shy i think to go out very much i stayed in a lot i stayed in playing video games a lot (laughs) but not getting paid for doing that uh and uh yeah and i didn't really go to i went to maybe about five or six showbiz parties i think and found them overwhelming yeah i never got into i never got i didn't uh, take drugs at all at that time uh, when I was a bit when I was a bit older, I tried cocaine, but I didn't take cocaine in my twenties. Yeah, in my teens. Uh, yeah, you did take cocaine in your uh, Yeah, in your 20s. I took cocaine. Cocaine took me. I took all. <laughs> I took all the cocaine, uh, all of it. Um, you know, poor Liam Gallagher just took what was left. Um, and I shouldn't be flippant about it because my mum is almost certainly watching this, and she gets very upset about this aspect of my life. But I think I felt the same as you, Richard. And I write about this in the book that I, I was so uncomfortable with that level of recognition and fame that all of a sudden yeah. here was alcohol. 
um, cocaine, speed, all these things that just gave you a, a, a kind of veneer and made you, A, find, um, gave you a supreme amount of confidence that I didn't have. But also um, the thing about cocaine, and I'm not using this as in any way an advocate, it makes boring people less boring. And I used to get so bored with the same people asking the same questions that all of a sudden I would hoover up a line and I'd be like, yeah, I'll gladly talk about my favorite video game. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it was a real shame and it had repercussions down the line for me, um, you know, like in terms of relationships and in terms of, um, uh, like, uh, like psychologically. Uh, and in fact, it's sure. one of, when I, you know, when I mentioned, um, uh, Mavami Moore, who was in David Icke in the Offense of Jesus and was the producer of Little Britain. And uh, and she she was my kind of first, second serious ever girlfriend. Um, we went out for years and she was so wonderfully helpful. She was such a wonderful kind of anchor for me at that time. But because I started, unbeknownst to her, battering the Ching Chang, and I ended up like just you know, finishing that relationship, not going up to see my family. And that was the last kind of bit of the anchor that chained me to reality. So from about 93, 94, it was just absolutely going tonto, uh, yeah. you know, with, you know, rock stars and footballers and, and all that. I was just basically, I was loaded magazine, basically yeah. made, made flesh. Well, I think that's when, when we and Stu were, were on the show, I think that's because we were, we were sort of, resistant to the new lad thing although we were slightly pigeonholed with it but we were we always found felt that a bit uncomfortable and i think that's pro i think we were probably like a a little bit standoffish when we we're on the show because we thought you know i there was a there's a double element because like you know we were showing i remember the thing i remember about being on is we walked onto stage by these two beautiful girls in scanty clothes yeah which you know i mean, there's a part of me thinking I don't like this. And there's a part of me thinking I really like this. And, you know, I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd better keep my eyes, eyes up, up front. Uh, so, you know, it's, you, you were sort of confused about it, but it felt like it did feel like quite a laddie yeah. show, but I suppose it, there, but it was sort of, there was a charm to games master because it was geeky and, you know, a laddie, but laddie, a teenage laddie, I suppose in a way as well. It was almost in between as he, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think I think it was it was always that, and I know it's it's. Listen, let's be honest; it's completely indefensible in twenty twenty one, right? That's it. I mean, not probably none of those shows would be able to be shown. I'm so glad that my children, even though they're massive gamers and and teenagers and everything now, um, they're aware of Games Master. Um, they they treat it with complete indifference. They haven't even watched the show. My wife never watched the show, and I'm quite glad about that now because my kids are extremely woke, and it, I would have no chance at justifying it. But what I liked, and I and I do make an effort to justify it in the book. And the only what I can yeah. say is that all of the double entendres, especially with with female contestants and female guests, they were always um, uh, co participants in it. I, I always did a pre chat with them so i would always gauge for myself are you up for this is this the way you're going to go and sometimes i would go that way sometimes i wouldn't you have someone like zoe ball on and she was completely up for it and she out knob gagged me on the show when she was on she was playing the game on the motorbike and i and i just said to her have you ever ridden a motorbike before she goes no but i like it up the back and i mean that's just so that's i mean that's the justification that's like okay fine we're both we're both playing the same game you're actually it's not a power thing we've both got equal power you know that's the whole thing we've all read our theories of comedy by jonathan miller and what not it's all about the power isn't it and i felt that in most cases most cases the power was equal when it came to female contestants and guests on the show I don't think, you know, it didn't feel super. There were things that were super, well, I mean, Loaded was sort of nasty. And, yeah. and But even, you know, even I remember me and Stu having to do, you know, you were made, not made to do, but you were, it was suggested you should do certain things. And we had to do photo shoots for Loaded, which were us in swimming costumes, squirting <laughs> sun cream over each other, which felt, which we, at least was fine. If we'd been, if we'd been with models it would have felt weird but it was sort yeah. of i mean it was pretty weird <laughs> but i mean i'm sure that you know i don't know i mean it was it's sort of interesting because i well let's talk about the 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 lee and herring on games master experience because uh we 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 were on and we had to we had to um, it was a terrible uh, thing the, we made you do it was awful <laughs> we had to edit to well it was quite i think it was quite a good thing to do for us actually because i don't think either of us would have been particularly adept and especially Stu at uh, video games yeah. Uh, so we had to edit together something to, and make a little short film from an editing package, but it was it was very limited, yeah. and it was then judged by 
It can't have been actually judged by Patrick Moore because he wasn't in the studio, right? But it was how very dear, judged. how very dare you, <laughs> how very dare you suggest that there was not a hundred percent authenticity on that show? You know, Patrick Moore was there, not Patrick Moore. Sorry, you know, Games Master was there in the okay, corner. He was there. He was there. You were sitting Barton on his knee judgment. and everything. You and Stu, you know, you loved it. But anyway, he did, Patrick, the Games Master, decided I was the best at doing that game. Yeah, uh, and I won. I won the golden joystick. And you know, I think like it's the only thing I, for a long time that I'd ever won on, and uh, in, in almost in anything. Uh, and yet, it did. I can't re- even quite remember what happened. It definitely has gone, right? Yeah. Which I, yeah. which I regret. No, you know, I, I think, you know, it has gone. You know, don't pretend you don't know because there's honestly, it's, it's definitely gone. But I can't remember how it went. Well, because fucking Stu smashed it on. But that wasn't the real one. That wasn't the real one. Oh, yeah, because I we thought. Don't... Oh, okay. <laughs> it was already we'd already like, I think we moved offices and we had to clear stuff out and I I keep everything and I don't know why I didn't keep it and even just to eBay it now I'd get like 200 oh, yeah. quid for it or something oh, you get you get more than that oh jeez oh yeah no there's the one one guy went uh, to sell one for 5000 pounds a couple of months ago wow. um but I think it was yeah because I remember watching that was it the, this morning with Richard not Judy I think it might have been that it was one one of the shows where yeah I don't completely and remember Stu, yes. Stu smashed it and the thing is of course he was always <laughs> going to do that and actually I, I like to think that I probably picked you uh, to win that movie thing because because there's always there's always what you'll find is when someone is that pretty that young, there's always something of the of the night about him, and Stuart Lee, there was always just that thing about him. Yeah. So it was no surprise that he was the one that smashed the joystick because he probably took a lot of fun in what was genuinely one of the most upsetting moments of my entire life. <laughs> it's fucking horrible of him. Well, he was jealous. You know, he'd lost. It wasn't good for the Lee and Herring dynamic for him to lose. That didn't happen. <laughs> so that you, it's. It, it, uh... You know, it it bucked that trend, yeah. And so, therefore, him sm- him smashing it, it was a good thing to do. But I think the BBC made us a replica one, but only because I think I'd thrown away the original yeah. one. Which I, I, you know, I absolutely, I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I didn't think this is an amazing thing to have. I don't know why I was full of shame about having been on Games Master. <laughs> do, you, do you know who still has theirs? Right? Who? Robbie Williams. Wow. Now he kindly has written the foreword for the book. And one of the reasons is because, and he's, he's a, it's a fantastic forward. It really is. He says it's had pride of place in every house he's had since. And he's had a lot of fucking houses, that guy. You know that. And um, so, yeah, <coughs> apparently he, he says that the MTV Awards and all that, they're in a the cupboard, but the Game is Master Golden Joystick is on his mantelpiece <laughs> all the time. So I'm glad that there was at least one person, you know, who, who respected well, he, he, it. He appreciated the true value. And he I does. Didn't. Um, all I remember is with it was filmed in the same studio as the uh, the big house in the country by Blur. Yeah, Blur house, Country House, the big house in the country, uh, and all the props for that video were were just sort of strewn around the set yeah. while we were recording, and I was very excited about that. That I was that, no, was that, cool. that was very special. Um, <laughs> I actually, uh, I'm going if I can crowbar this this in just now because I don't want to forget yeah. about it, and it seems apt that um, yeah. I actually um, I've I've written uh, I've written some verse about your appearance on the show that day. And it's one of the uh, the rewards that we have on, on the Kickstarter page. So we, we funded it on day one uh, completely, which was, was a great relief because uh, public humiliation is a terrible thing. So I'm very pleased that we did it. Um, and we had a lot of Dominic Diamond flavored uh, rewards and they all went. And one of them was uh, the Poet Master, which is basically you get the book and I write a bespoke limerick in the pages of the book in uh, about the buyer and the show Games Master. So you're yoked finally for eternity for the poor people who didn't manage to get on the show. But of course, you did get on the show. So here's just an example, just a couple of things. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm the same way that you don't like to be called a hero. I don't like to be called a poet. <laughs> I mean, I, I I can work in different forms, you know. I yeah. mean, I can shit out quatrains with the best of them, you know. Haikus, piece of piss. But Limerick, I think, is actually one of the more one of the more challenging verse forms, verse forms, because you've got the two tiny little lines, line three and four of the limerick. It's only like five, six syllables. That's really hard. That's really hard. Okay, so. well, I'm glad. It's good to see to the artist <laughs> process here to have that I'm explained. Quite, I'm quite transparent about it. <laughs> so what I've tried to do is I've tried to, and it, but even then, even then, Richard, that wasn't ambitious enough for me. I tried to incorporate your life today into the limerick okay. as well. Okay, so there's two. Here's the first one. (laughs) A funny young fellow called Rich 
came on Games Master with his bitch. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> in 2020? Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah, I think it's all right because it's about a man, so that's fine. That, that, okay, right. A funny young fellow called Rich <laughs> came on Games Master <laughs> with his bitch. They each made a movie. Rich's was groovy. He's got a joystick and one ball he can itch. So <laughs> trying to bring the cancer in yeah, in a gentle, humorous way. That was nice. That was nice. Number two, Rich came on a show called Games Master. He made his movie better and faster. The golden joystick he won, then in 2021, found his testicles covered in plasters. So again, I'm trying to just make cancer more approachable, like you have it's done. Good, it is, yeah. It is so good. that's it's the good. kind Thank of thing you. I'll write in the book for people. And we've just, because they all went straight away. So we've just literally, to tie in with the show, released 50 more of those on the Kickstarter page right now. So whether you've had testicular problems or not, that's not an essential yeah. part. I mean, know. I hope that isn't all that survives of my memory or of our civilization, because it'll just imply that all I did in my career was be on Games Master and, and lose a ball. <laughs> yeah. And I feel I've done more. I feel I've done more than that. There are people who would be proud. There are people who've achieved I less. Guess that's enough. That's, I don't know. That's enough. That's Pretty enough. Patel. <laughs> um, and well, let's let's do a few more bits of uh, of of Games Master mem- memories. You married Wigfield. I, I, that was in the same series as we did. I think yeah. it was in nineteen ninety five. Yes. You married. Did was that a legally binding? wedding to Wigfield? I know it was a toss-up between what we were going to do with Wigfield and what we were going to do with Lee and Herring. So, you know, <laughs> you got away with that one, I guess. Um, and um, no, it's not. It's, I don't think it's legally binding. She's not answering my calls either, so who knows. Um, but what, what I thought was brilliant about that was having just said, oh, yeah, you know, we were always very, made sure that all the female guests were prepped in advance and they were, no, we didn't tell Wigfield anything about that. But I think that speaks to the underrated genius of the Europe pop queen the fact that she had no clue what was happening she comes on she obviously doesn't you know speak english as a, as a first language um and then all of a sudden this random guy gets down on one knee and proposes to her but she goes with it she goes with it with a level of self-awareness that i don't think scandinavia has in general and i've got my a lot of my wife's family are scandinavian and they're humorless fucks i mean they have no sense of humor whatsoever so i think that that was she was phenomenal about that she was brilliant she was a lot of fun but i never saw her after that oh yeah, it's the, it's the story of your life. Well, it's sort of like this, you know, it's a snapshot of the night. There could be Lee and Herring and Wigfield and Dominic Diamond. Yeah. It's the 1990s. That's it's it. the ni- that is the 1990s. That's brilliant. That's it. In uh, Soho House, basically. In Soho House, in London. <laughs> that's it. That is it. Watching Euro 96. <laughs> <laughs> and is it true that you only met uh, Patrick Moore on one occasion right at the end of the... Yeah, series. Yeah, that is true, and it, it's weird because um, I, uh, it's again, it's weird thinking back on the show and realizing that we were a double act of sorts. A lot of people, you know, would think of Dominic Diamond and then immediately think of Patrick Moore, like you would a comedy double act. But we never, you know, we, we never. I, I had no hand in any of his stuff. I didn't write any of his stuff. I didn't meet him until the last day. Uh, I think having watched the shows again for the book. He's considerably better than I am. I, I, I was appalled. I think we do things, especially when we're in our 20s, um, and we think we are absolutely brilliant. We think we're absolutely fantastic. We're just the shit. And I, I, looking back at series one and two of Games Master, I think I'm dreadful. I think I'm really bad. It's not me for a start. I think I'm playing a character that I'm not like at all. Um, and then I went away for series three and then I came back for series four and I felt really indignant and angry um, with the show, you know, because they fucking, you know, got Dexter and it didn't work out and then they had to get me back. And I'm like, yeah, fuck you, fuck everyone. So, so series four, I'm very angry. Um, and it really wasn't uh, until series five, which you were on and, and, uh, and Wakefield, that I finally settled down a bit and I think I'm okay. But Patrick yeah. Moore, for someone who, as far as I know, had no formal comic training, he wasn't he wasn't at Durham or Bristol University or Cambridge. He was. He was, was he? <laughs> no. Was he? Patrick? Who knows where he was. Oh, yeah. I, thought, I suddenly thought you were going to say, no, Patrick Moore was in Footlights. And I thought, oh, my <laughs> God, I would have he paid could, to well, see he, that. I'm sure he went to university, but he yeah. probably studied uh, the cosmos. Rather. Exactly. But he, he just managed to deliver these lines brilliantly 
just brilliantly comedically, despite genuinely not knowing one end of a Nintendo entertainment system from the other. So he was a much underrated comic genius. I've said it. I'll put my name to that quote. He, he was. Yeah. He really was. So, yeah, I just met him on poetically the very last day of filming, and uh, he was coming out having done his bits. I was going in to do some voiceover. And uh, he had no idea who I was. Didn't even recognize me. Bastard. I had to actually say to him, pa- Dominic Diamond. From fucking Games Master, Patrick. <laughs> oh, yes, young man. Oh, hello, young man. And uh, so um, so we spoke about cricket. He was a big cricket fan. Um, uh, and apparently a bit of a closet racist. But yeah, okay. um, we didn't talk about Down that. Um, so, uh, and yeah, that is, that is there's, there's different aspect. People knew Patrick a bit more than I did, a bit better. And they have very different recollection of what the real Patrick Moore was like when he'd had a curry and a couple of sherries, which apparently was part of his contract. After filming, he would go right. and get taken for a curry. It's kind of extraordinary that you could have not, I mean, A, that you bumped into him on the very last possibility that you could, but that that had never happened in the in the previous eight years or whatever that, yeah. that you'd been working with him. It's sort of it sounds it's like it's almost unbelievable. It's almost like the kind of fake anecdote you would make up for a book. <laughs> but it really it but it isn't. I've got corroboration. <laughs> but I love that. the fact that that generation of guys they would and we were the same you know we would have lots of people on our on our shows, you know, the older generation comedians and it was always, you know, slight we weren't as mean as some like I think the word was a mean show and yeah. And um, you know the Ian Lee show was sometimes a bit mean about people. We we were we were sort of generous and loving about them, but it was always a, in a veiled in irony. You know, yeah. you have Bernie Clifton on or whoever that we that we liked, but or Brian Cant who we loved, but you know we, we're making him do something weird. But they were they you know for them this is a job, <laughs> Brian, and we're Kant. gonna do we're gonna do <laughs> we're gonna do it well. And they would always come on and be so professional and so brilliant, and also ultimately they knew they would they'd. What, you know, because they were older, and so they could see us for the idiots we were. Yeah, and and they they knew that if they just did the job well, that that they were they were winning basically. So yeah. you know, it was. But I think we we were we were we were never cruel with with that, and I think some people are sort of cruel in terms of that kind of has been thing. But you know, that comes around to bite you, doesn't it? You know, I think that's the thing because they. I think if you've been in show business or whatever on TV for that length of time. If you're in your 70s or 80s, you're going to go, you know, people come and go and you know, these kids are thinking, oh, look at this guy who's famous 20 years ago yeah. in 20 years time. He'll be on Twitch doing his show to people in our broth. No idea who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like that I'm would like be me. really sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you met, you mentioned Brian Cant because uh, when yeah. uh, uh, when I was still working for BBC Radio 5 Live, and we, we did one show, uh, a weekly kind of comedy show with a very small C. And as part of it, we had, uh, we had uh, childhood icons who came on to review the latest record releases. So it was a wonderful chance for me to get all these people like Brian Jacks from Superstars uh, and um, <laughs> Dr. Robert from the Blow Monkeys was another one. And we had Tony Arthur um, from nice. Play Away. And I am not, she, I couldn't speak. I was so in love with her. She came into the studio. She was just still the most beautiful woman that I'd ever seen in my life. And it was also responsible for the single most whole cringingly embarrassing moment of my entire career. And so Brian Jacks, and in case people uh, don't remember, so he was a he was a, a judo performer, and there was a thing called Superstars, which was a, a wonderful TV show where all these different sportsmen from different things, football and athletics and whatnot, competed in things like squat thrusts and dips and everything like that. And it was a brilliant show. Brian Jacks was the best ever. He like won it more years than anyone. So we thought it was a real coup to get him on the show. And he came on and he was reviewing the latest single by The Cars. The lovely Irish band with the with the, the lovely sisters and, and that one brother. Yeah. And I said to him live on the BBC. So Brian, what do you think about the cars? And he said, if I was their father, I'd still be barfing him. It was like, <laughs> it was like what? What? <laughs> <laughs> It was just like still the most jaw dropping moment I, I can ever imagine, you know, <laughs> anyone ever go. But then, you know, compared to you and, you know, Stephen Merchant and stuff like that, that's a walk in the park. You, you yeah. and Richard I E. Mean, Grant, that's to, probably nothing. You know? There's probably nothing. 
he had to stretch. You know, he isn't their father. But if I was, I would have to put myself imagine to make this uncomfortable. I have to imagine. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I Tony Arthur was not my neighbour for a while. Uh, really, the same street as me in in Clapham. Yes, yeah, so I knew her a little. I bump into her a little bit and say hello to. Her. And she, yeah, so it's sort of that's a weird thing because you know I've no, you with you and I we'd known Tony Arthur since we were yeah. four or five years old. Yeah. And so then to be to, to to actually it's it's one of those things, and that's what I guess that all those things where people meet their meet these old time people in with veiled in irony. Yeah. yeah, they still are. You can you still know that they love it because they're still the little kids who are watching them yeah, on TV. So exactly. it's, it's all all I know I'm, is if if Tony Arthur was my neighbour, you know, <laughs> and I was still a child, I'd she'd still, still be, be buffing. Bu- she'd still be buffing me. <laughs> no, that's even worse. I've just basically done to Tony Arthur what you did to Stephen Merchant. No, <laughs> <laughs> she's a very lovely woman. She is. Yes. Oh my, very lo- my <laughs> poor mum. Shit. My mum, my mum's like that, um, and I don't know if you ever, if you ever had parental concerns raised about your stuff. But my mum was always that person who said, oh, "You're going to be doing the nasty stuff again." Remember, they <laughs> they've got a mum too. They've got, and I and I'd say, "But mum, it's you know, it's it's David Beckham that I'm ripping the piss out. He's still got a mum. Even Victoria Beckham's got a mum." And I say, do you, "Is that? Do you really know that for sure? Was she not ripped from a jackal?" But um, but no, so. So yeah, my mum has my mum has been a real kind of um, a guiding kind of force attempt yeah. at good in my life. Sadly, for I think her. my parents have basically got used to it. They they do watch it. I think they watch everything I do on this now. So they I do a stupid puppet show, but because the puppet that my main puppet is this 129 year old ventriloquist dummy that my great granddad made, I think they're sort of in. They're actually quite pleased that yeah. I'm using it and doing quite well with it even though i'm just making it say disgusting things so they they seem to they seem to be able to tune out the yeah that's important the, the rudeness and the disgusting yes. <laughs> of it all um so let well there's so much to talk to you about don't it and i'm is there try and get is there though there is, is there really there is quite a lot thank there you is. for saying that thank you richard i um, appreciate that i think well i think but you know i think it's it's you know we've we've got we've had a similar-ish sort of experience i guess and not not in exactly the same way but i think it's i think it's it's interesting that whole i think you were more successful than us in the 90s really you were more famous than us in the 90s yes and then, but you're cons- but have then, been considerably more successful since <laughs> <laughs> well we've gone into different ways but we both had to you know we've both had to cope with losing you know not having that anymore mm. did you did you find that a difficult thing to transition from the TV to I mean I know it was a it was a progression it wasn't just one day it was there and one day it wasn't but w- was that was that a, a was it a welcome relief or was it a difficult transition to not be uh, on TV anymore not be famous anymore I don't know because I think that I I honestly never ever I I hate I hate seeing my face on television complete I hate seeing my I mean I hate seeing my face on this it's horrific um and it really uh, so is. so I. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. So I um I, I never liked watching the shows back. I never watched a lot of the shows back. I never had an after um and I you know after Games Master Live basically when series two and we did this massive event at the Birmingham NEC um the kind of stadium stuff that you guys would have ended up doing and that terrified me. That amount of people in a room with me really scared scared the shit out of me. Uh, and um. So I was never looking for that. I just wanted to be able to kind of do good work and do kind of stuff I wanted. So from that point of view, it was very disappointing that I always, I loved video games, but I really loved music. And all I wanted to do really was to do funny stuff about music on Radio 1 or do comedy shows or stuff. And I never got the chance to do that until uh, the XFM uh, show in Scotland in the 2000s where I finally it was the only the first time I'd ever done something since Games Master that I thought okay this is what I want to do but I was very lucky that from uh, being a working class kind of kid the money is is a really important part of it that all the extra spin-off stuff and and things like gravitating towards being a columnist for the Daily Star you know that paid us, us more money so yeah. it wasn't something that I, I wasn't sitting there. For example, I wasn't sitting in Canada in 2021, you know, thinking, fucking hell, I hope this Kickstarter comes off, you know, so it was never like that. Um, so it, it was, it was more of kind of career goals that was disappointing yeah. rather than any kind of loss of profile or, or anything like that. And that's how, what has been great about this 
lucky second career in Canada on the radio is that it's radio. And in spite of of evil, stupid, cynical radio bosses' attempts to say, oh, let's make fucking YouTube videos. No, it's radio. Shut up. Fucking people want to watch videos. They watch the telly, you idiots. Um, so, but, so my face is not known, really, in Canada. So as long as I put on a, a Richard Herring accent, for example, yeah. uh, when I go and get my milk, it's been all right. I've been kind of, you know, relatively obscure, which has been a... Uh, you know, which is which has been good, I guess. Yeah. And do you feel because I feel like you were quite a uh, you know you were quite a is bolshy the right word? You yes. you got into fights with you got into fights with people. You were you were you had a, a certain degree of confidence, which may have come along yeah. with the drugs. Yes. Um, and yeah. do, do you feel that because of that you missed? Because I, I heard you on one of the interviews I heard you talk about today missing out on sort of fronting the BBC football coverage that you just sort of turned it down yeah, that sort of was, through, through arrogance. Yeah, that was really, that was really <laughs> silly. Bob Shannon, yeah. who, who Bob Shannon, who actually became, he was like the head of, of Radio 2, I think at one point, and, and was like a massive figure in the BBC. He started off, sadly for him, as my immediate boss on this sports call show that I did. He was the editor. Uh, so so the poor, poor guy had to deal with me throughout the 90s. And I remember... Um, him saying to me, right, listen, Dominic, we, we really feel that you need to move on from sports call. You've done it for nine years and it's been great and it's been a success, but we want you to, to spread your wings a bit more. We'd really like you to become one of the rotating anchors on our main Saturday football coverage. Now, any normal person would have gone, thank you so much, but that is the most incredible career break. Uh, someone my age in my late 20s could have, but this, would, this will transition me perfectly over into the next camera stage of my career. And I literally said to him, fuck you, Bob, I want to do comedy. And I fucking walked out. <laughs> what an idiot. What an absolute idiot. I have, I have burnt more bridges than the retreating Nazi army did. I mean, it really, it was just absolutely horrific. Uh, and it was very, very stupid, especially the BBC, because um, once, if you're lucky enough to get into, I mean, I was lucky enough to get Games Master. And then the fact of, you know, a, a year later, um, thanks to, in a roundabout manner, thanks to Dave Lee Travis quitting Radio 1 on air and then Nicky Campbell moving from Radio 5 to Radio 1 and me having the same agent as Nicky Campbell. I just got given a show at the BBC. All these poor people, it was just the biggest dream and I get that at 23. And once you're in the BBC, don't ever leave. Don't ever leave, no matter what you have to do. And because it's, you realize when you go to the commercial side of things, and especially commercial radio, it's awful. And by comparison, there's the level of support and funding. I mean, I, I, I did a talk show uh, in Edinburgh, Talk 107, where I did a drive time show. Uh, and it was a phone in news show without a producer without a researcher, without even someone to answer the phones. So it'd be me and my co-host, and we'd be talking, talking, talking about all the breaking news in Edinburgh, which, you know, outside of that one month a year, <laughs> and where the fringe is nothing. And then we'd have to, the phone lines would be flashing, and we couldn't screen them. We had to go to a break, answer all these calls, have them lined up. And I kept thinking, Sports Call on the BBC was a one-hour <laughs> quiz show. I had... 10 people, 10 people working on that show alone. So it's a source of much, much, much regret that, you know, <laughs> it really is. It was so bad. And my mum just now is nodding. My mum is nodding now <laughs> going, I told you, I told you. Because one of the horrible things of that was my mum actually worked for me at that time. And this is the, this is the worst thing that I ever did. No. Yeah, it was probably the worst thing in a lot of ways. So my mum worked for my production company. And kind of like was the, you know, kind of ran the office and, and helped on sports call and appeared on my shows. And and she literally was saying to me, she came up to me one day and said, Dominic, listen, don't think I don't know what you're doing. I see you and all, on all your funny researchers hoovering up the cocaine all the time. You know, you need to stop that. It's it's turning you into a terrible person. And I let her say, yeah, you think that's terrible? You're fired. So I think, I mean, it's to I fired my own mum, and and if you know, and you know, yes, these stories are fucking engaging stories now in retrospect. But but the serious side is that honestly, if anybody is in any way thinking ever of doing cocaine, don't don't. I mean, it's the most horrific. It turns you into an absolute monster. It makes you do the most terrible, evil things. And so, um, uh, 
so yeah, so that was it. That's the only time I ever fell out with my mum. And luckily we, we patched it up eventually. Um, but I will go to my grave feeling uh, apologetic yeah. about that. It's a terrible thing to do, you know. On the other hand, I didn't take cocaine, and so I never got invited to any of the parties, so I didn't really get to network with anyone, and so my career wasn't successful either. So you've got to find a middle ground where you do a, you <laughs> yeah, do a bit. Just just somewhere not enough in the cocaine middle. to sack your mum. There's, there's a line. Not enough cocaine to get some work. <laughs> there's a line betwixt herring and diamond, I think. <laughs> the is. mean line that we're looking for. <laughs> if you can chart that course while all about are losing theirs, you'll be a success, my son. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think, you know, it's so difficult to I think people can't appreciate I think how hard it is to sort of get that level of responsibility and money and success and attention to someone who's already attention seeking which is both of us in your 20s you know and it's it's incredible that people get through that their 20s and 30s in show business and and are normal (laughs) later on I think you know they're not necessarily normal at the time but it's sort of incredible to get through it um uh, I, I, so I was looking at you. To, there was something saying you were you had a big long argument like that lasted with Mark Lamar over two different years. Basically, you saw him oh, and you yeah. had a fight with him. And yeah. then, but I, I can't I can't imagine you and I mean Mark Lamar was someone else who was incredibly yeah. confident and and bolshy and wouldn't take any <laughs> shit at all. So yeah. the two of you getting together, I feel like would be. Oh. The that, worst possible thing that could ever happen. That that was, was a it, that it, was a brilliant one. That was a cracker. That was yeah. That was a two part beef, uh, basically. Um, so uh, and again, and I'll tell the story. Normally, I'm I'm very coquettish, and I'll say, well, if you want to read that one, buy the book. But seeing as it's you and you contributed okay. to the book, you're you're special. We've established that uh, one nut. Fair enough. You know, you're <laughs> nearly dead. Oh, can I say something before I forget that you're going to love? Yeah. Right. This is why I found your recent health problems uh, incredibly touching. Was I did um, I did a, a podcast earlier this week, and it's a guy called Chris Scullion, who's a lovely video games journalist, and he found out this fact. He said that out of the nearly 180 guests on Games Master, only six of them out of all those celebrities have died. The rest of them are still alive, and he thinks that's the greatest track record of celebrity health <laughs> of any show from the nineties. And I was that like, "Oh good. shit, Herring is going to be number seven. <laughs> Like, that would be quite an exclusive club you would have been in there, yeah. you know. Basically, you and Emlyn Hughes and Bob Holness, and you know, not many people. Um, but anyway, but, but, but back, back, to, back to Lamar. Um, and uh, and you know what, you know, that fucking Stuart Lee would have been milking it for all it's worth if that had happened. Oh, yeah, well, you know, I fucking loved him, I was really sad, and you know, I remember games. Oh, fuck off, anyway. So, <laughs> I'm only kidding, Stu, or whatever you're calling yourself these days. So, um yeah, so Mark Lamar, um, this was basically because I always had a thing about the ward. It was my favorite TV show, but I was really bitter and resentful that I wasn't given the job as presenter on it, even though it was someone from there that recommended me from Games Master and I wouldn't have got the show without it. So Mark Lamar, who I think I appeared with on the bill once when I was a young stand-up in Bristol and I hated the fact that he was better than me at stand-up anyway. Um, so I met him at one of these quintessential 90s video game launch parties. It was for some big game or some console. I remember the bootleg Beatles were performing, one of the finest cover bands, and, and Mark Lamar was emceeing. And I got into a chat with him and that was genuinely the first night I ever did um, uh, both cocaine and speed in the same night. W- why rush? Take your time, Dominic. Fuck it. You know, it's like Sodom and Gomorrah at once. So that was the worst possible time for Mark Lamar to meet me for the first time. And he was incredibly nice. Oh, oh nice to meet you, Dominic. Oh, how are you doing? Or however he speaks. <laughs> Terrible Mark Lamar impression. Jeez. And um, so, uh, so yeah, he was being very nice. And then I, I happened to say to him, what do you prefer more, TV presenting or stand-up? And he said, oh, I think I, I'll prefer the stand-up. I feel it's more authentic and honest. And for some reason, I switch flicked and I went, you fucking pretentious cunt. <laughs> and he kind of was really shocked. And he's like, what? Except bearing in mind it was the first time I did cocaine, I probably said, you fucking pretentious cunt. Right? <laughs> and then he was just like, what? And I just proceeded to just lambast him for how fickle wow. and pretentious and fake he was. And for rightly, answering your question. <laughs> for politely answering your question. <laughs> no. And so he, he was really, he was taken aback and I was probably very yeah. aggressive. And then that was that. We went our separate ways. And then a few years later, I happened to be in San Francisco filming for Games Master and uh, Supergrass, 
had a gig there. And so uh, we ended up back, we went to the gig, me and the team, and we went backstage and Mark Lamar was there as well. So there's this uh, slightly awkward thing of Mark Lamar at one end, me at there, super grass, big hairy mediators in between. And um, and then we end, I said like, look, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry, Mark. I was like, oh no, that's okay. Don't worry. No, no, Mark, honestly, I was, I was an absolute arsehole and I really apologize. Oh, that's okay. That's fine. And so we chatted away the rest of the night and then it came to leaving. And I'll never forget, we, we exited this theatre in San Francisco and I turned right to go my way he turned left to go his way and Mark Lamar got to the corner and turned and I hear oi Dominic and I went yeah and he went you're a fucking cunt <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time I saw Mark Lamar uh, <laughs> so, so yeah it's, it was a, it's been a complex relationship with Mark over the years yeah you know yeah yeah, and can I just say to my mum, I'm using that word in context as part of an anecdote. It's, well, yeah, you're quoting. That's fine. You would never say that. It's, but it's did, cinema verity. Would, it was a quote. Cinema verity. <laughs> I just remembered. That I remember sudden flashback. To, I can't remember whether it was you or Stu on Games Master when you were making your little movies, and I, you, one of you definitely said claimed that yours was cinema verity, and I was very happy about that because <laughs> I always, I really tried because I did philosophy A level, and I ended up doing a little philosophy radio shows on Radio 4 and I was really, I was always upset that no one ever mentioned them it was always Games Master so I kept trying to get in jokes about Descartes and everything into the show <laughs> and the producer in Series 1 and 2 would just chop it out and I was only very, very lucky that from Series 4 onward a wonderful man Johnny Finch became the producer who became one of my best friends who, who was the most well-read man in the world, he will not read anything published after Beowulf. So, um, so he <laughs> he started to let me drop in philosophy things. So when you guys said cinema verity, it was just like a, a, a little bit of we came out. I was so pleased. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that's lovely. Um, and so, look, will it ever return? Will Games Master come back? And w- if it does, you could be the Games Master. You could be in the little bubble up there, being scary to children. Very awkward, awkward question that, Richard, because they are yeah. apparently trying to bring it back, Channel 4, are to they? tie in with the 30th anniversary, which this book, which yeah. is how this book came about. And uh, and they've tried to do it, the, the rights holders have tried to bring back the show numerous times uh, in the ensuing period. Um, at no point have they got me involved or even called me, and at no point has it ever come off make of that what you will so yeah i think they're trying to bring it back but i've heard nothing about it it's not you know it's not my show it's it's their show i don't have the rights they're perfectly entitled to do a series without me they did it before it was shit but you know me who knows who knows you might strike it lucky so i don't know and i, I don't want to piss them off because they very kindly gave me the rights to the book but there's old 90s dominic raising his head again <laughs> can't resist <laughs> can't resist it it's the mark lamar anecdote it's just transformed me <laughs> transported me back into that time but there is, you know, there is something about you and, you know, and maybe that's, you know, it, you, the way you got the job is sort of by happenstance almost. But it was the it was the meeting of those things. And, you know, and the Dexter Fletcher uh, series did not didn't work in the same way. So, you know, it was it was difficult shoes for you to step into. He's done OK subsequently. <laughs> He's done all right. He really <laughs> done has right. done OK. I mean, I don't, you know, in the, in the same way that you don't like to be called a hero, even though you are, I don't like to compare yeah. my career to Dexter's. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's fair on either of us. But um, no, I, I don't I, think that's fair. I, I, I do have to say, fair. actually, what is it? It's, it is my genuinely my favourite chapter in the whole book is the one that covers series three, because I didn't even know half of what was going on behind the scenes. It was an absolute disaster. It was a brand new team who just screwed the whole thing up. And then poor Dexter was the guy that was put in front of it. And people people remember him so fondly, his work ethic, him as a person. And because he's the face of a show, he carried the can. And the horrible abuse online that he gets to this day is, is, is really bad. And I think it's a fascinating chapter of the book and it will completely change anyone's view of Dexter and what he managed to do with sure. the show. He actually did an amazing job. Wow. I mean, that's, well, it's interesting <laughs> the book goes into that much detail and that, it, and that you're getting the behind the hit scene stuff for it. It's, it's wow. you know, it does feel the right time for it to come out. But I think the show, it needs you in, on some on some level, even if it's just like a little gremlin popping out of a of a hole every now and again to shout at people. No, bigger, bigger than that. More than that, mate. More than that, Rich. Come on. <laughs> three kids, three kids, Richard. Come on. 
fucking little gremlin. Do you, do you work for Channel 4 or something? That's great. <laughs> Sounds like the kind of stuff they'd come up with. Brilliant. Little fucking little gremlin. I strode the 90s like a colossus, <laughs> you cheeky bastard. Gremlin. You could dress you up in a skin tight, like leotard, and you just come out and go, ah! It could be your role in it. That's what I'd like to see. You're just full of ideas today, aren't you? You know what? I think this chemo is working out great for you, actually. Oh, contraire. It's okay. It's okay. I think once it's, the adrenaline gets through you, it's fine. It's going to create a, a, a fecund period, I think, in your career. It is. I think it is. Chemo fecundity. That's I'd, a good name for I'd, a band. You know, have a, have a ball taken off and see what happens to the rest of your life, Dominic. That's that's my advice to you. Just get one whipped off. Don't tempt my wife. It, it, uh, it focuses Sorry, that was a Les head. Dawson type punchline. He was, sorry, that was a very old school comedian punchline there. Sorry. Oh look, uh, hey, look, we've we've taken up a lot of your time. So where where um if they just if people google kickstarter and games master yeah. they will find the links to this thing that's it. Is that, how long is that right because it might not be running while the actual podcast is going out will people be able to buy the book after the kickstarter is over or is it not not in its current form no there's 20 more days 20 more days of the campaign the campaign will run then up till about 20th of uh april what are we okay. what month are we in just now are we in april are we in no it's March. we're about to yeah. we're about to start okay. april thank you i, I don't know if it's podcast different will go out in, in Canada. podcast will go out the day after, after yeah. your Kickstarter. Well. We have a different calendar. We're using okay. the uh, Corinthian calendar as opposed to the Julian or something. Uh, so, yes. Okay. So, yeah, it's about uh, kind of 20th of April. You can fund it until and get all the extra rewards. We've got a couple of other really exciting ones that we're hoping to release in the ensuing uh, period. Brilliant. Well, best of luck with that. I think it looks uh, – the little bits I've seen it are fantastic, and it's a really interesting – uh, to go, and it's just you know, it's this little treasure trove of both a time in television history, but mm. also like gaming. I mean, gaming in the nineties was it was just exploding, wasn't it, into something more than yeah, you know, pong, and, and it was a bit better. It was a bit more than that in the eighties, but the nineties was where video games were just sort of coming to life, and so I think it's a really important. Um, social history as well as a lot of fun so uh it is I yeah, and it's, and it's, I mean it's like, and enjoy it. there's a, I mean it's a hundred thousand words so I mean there's there's a lot you get a lot of words for your money in this and, and lots of behind the scenes pictures that people wouldn't have seen before and everything so um so yeah no we're very very proud of it and uh and uh I mean I did so but I must pay tribute to Jack Templeton who was the original games master super fan started off as a stalker of me uh became a friend uh you've communicated with him yourself he's a lovely guy and the work he has done in this book has been incredible he's the one that got the band back together so jack templeton thank you brilliant and what else is coming is there anything else coming did i hear you were thinking of coming back to the united kingdom or is that, was I, that? yeah I, I was going to be um uh I, I was going to come back to the united kingdom in this last summer but uh, because covid made me honestly kind of worried that my mum might die before I saw her again and we started thinking about family and my plan was I was going to come back and I um I, ha I have a couple of ideas I want to do Edinburgh this last kind of the, the idea that I was a failed stand-up is the one last thing that I want to try and write in some way so I had a couple of ideas for Edinburgh shows one about that period of my life where I didn't get crucified um on channel five I think that's an interesting story not many people are famous for not getting crucified a few people are very famous for getting crucified yeah. jesus one, one Spar oh, spartacus let's be fair as well um and just saint andrew you know, yeah exactly yeah. yeah he went all pretentious did it in the kind of diagonal <laughs> way hipster um but i think i'm the only person that's famous for not getting crucified barabbas i think and me so there's an interesting yeah. story there <laughs> about that uh and there was also i had an idea when i was on twitch i used to write lots of video game songs because i've always had bands so dominic diamond sings the video games i thought was a potential edinburgh show with me in a bow tie and a full orchestra and with them um, with stuart herring popping up as a little gremlin from the stage going <laughs> yeah i mean you know for for example so uh, yeah, but okay. that's that's been put on hold. So I've just I've started writing another book, um, and uh, but like a novel about my life in Nova Scotia, which was like Royston Vasey on acid. And so um, so yeah, so I loved writing this book so much. I'm beavering away at that now. That's it. The end. That's terrific. Well, I hope to see you at the hope to see you at the Edinburgh Fringe. I hope to be back there. May 2022, I think, is the realistic. Yeah. Uh, but time to go back, but uh, yeah, fantastic. Look, re I really appreciate the time. Have a lovely day in Canada. Thank you, Richard. And uh, and have the and good luck with the book, and we'll see you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, the amazing Dominic Diamond. We'll be back next week. Haven't got a guest yet. We'll see who it's going to be. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank Goodbye. you. 
How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>